WBNE. Howdy, yokes. Before we get started today, we just want to let you know that this episode of Bacon and Eggs is brought to you by WBNE, the network itself. Oh my gosh, exciting news. We have three new shows coming to the network, and through the next three weeks of Bacon and Eggs content, we will be highlighting those three new shows, one each week. They're very good. It's very exciting. And Ethan and I are back on the microphones. Thank you for 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 giving us the time that we so badly needed. Oh my god. But anyway, three new shows coming to WBNE. Very exciting. Be on the lookout. Check the website for updates and be excited to listen to new podcasts that you're going to love because we handpick every show that ends up on this network and we would only pick shows that we knew that you would love. Howdy, Yokes, and welcome back to Bacon and Eggs. I'm Tyler Carlin. And I'm Ethan Edgehill. And today we're eliminating the threat of thermonuclear war. Or maybe we're just playing tic-tac-toe. So hack into the NORAD weapons computer. And change your grades. Because today we're bringing you War Game. Oh, right. I, you, uh, before I even get to the fun stuff, didn't isn't this exactly what it did in Ferris Bueller, where he was like, I wanted a car, they got me a computer. Welcome back to Bacon and Eggs. My name is Ethan Edgehill. The boys are back. The boys are back. I can't believe you didn't watch Willow with me. You have to watch it. Do I? You, oh my God, yes you do. I'm reading I... Warwick Davis's biography right now and I'm so Yeah, in. I've never had any interest in that movie whatsoever. Oh my God, it's so fantastic. I think I'm going to watch it five or six more times. I loved it. What even is it? it is, it's just this like fantastical tale about this young sorcerer and he goes off on this fantastic journey because a baby is floated down the river to him and he finds Val Kilmer, Batman himself in a cage and his name is Mad Mardigan. Val Kilmer is. And it's just, I don't know, they go on this like wacky hoozy wootsy adventure. It's super I wouldn't say fun. wacky is the best adjective to describe something that you're trying to pitch to me. I generally don't love movies that self-describe as wacky adventures. Did you did you like The Princess Bride? Uh, yeah. You will like this. Okay, we'll see. Uh, I got a lot of books to read between now and the end of time. Yeah, oh my god, the book challenge. Let's get back to the podcast, because that's what people are here well, for. Let's get back to the podcast. Directed by John Badham of uh, Saturday Night Fever fame. The Bad Ham himself. It came out June 3rd, 1983, oh. which is some time ago. How many days ago? It was what? on a $12 million budget. It made $79.6 million worldwide. It had a 93% critic rating and a 76% 13, audience 13,752 days ago as, 13, of, as the crow flies. Uh, and a 77 on Metacritic. This is all much higher scores than I was expecting. I very much enjoyed it, but I didn't expect these scores. You didn't expect a 76% audience rating? No, that I did. The 93 okay. and the 77 are surprising to me. I see. I think this is that. I think these scores make sense because this is again. It's one of those movies where like I can understand 93% of critics being like this is a six. I can understand 93% of critics really liking. I I can tell you one thing. Watching this in 2021, there were. Only a few things where I was like, well, I mean, everything I was like, oh, things have changed. But but it, it, it did a really good job of like stepping me back in time in a way where I didn't feel like I could critique it in the same way that I critique films of the 2020s, if that makes sense, and the 20 teens. Uh, yeah. But- yeah, I mean, I we, did, so we never lived through the Cold on. War, right? Like, we don't have the... You have to live through the Cold War. Yes, yes. And, and, and like, we're living through our Corona War right now. But, like, which, more so than any other event, like, I can understand... I mean, I can't understand what it was like to live through the London Blitz, but I can wrap my head around World War II, right? Like, that was a pretty straightforward... Right. Co- you know, you had good guys, and they wore good guy uniforms. You had bad guys, and they wore bad guy uniforms. Right. The Cold War, like, just the constant fear... I love Cold War movies, too. Like, there's nothing better than a good... Like, The Hunt for Red October. October, nothing better than a good Cold War movie. But uh, the Cold War, like, so our, our, our parents lived through this, and uh, the way that I've heard them talk about it is like, oh, did your parents? Do your parents remain absolutely f- terrified of the Russians to this day, no matter what, absolutely. no matter what anybody tells them? Yeah, absolutely. 
Mine did too. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, so th- I think that's interesting. I think that's interesting. It's something you never, never grew out of, apparently. No, but then like I was born and I was like, I mean, yeah, they're people, and uh, probably some of them are not very nice, and some of them are, I don't know, yeah, nice. My dad was an interesting case because he li- he like lived he basically have... through the entire Cold War. Right. He was he, he was, was like born in fifty two years older than my parents. Yeah, he was born in fifty two. So he lived through the entirety of the Cold War. Like he could talk about being in elementary school and like how they, they would hide to their desks and stuff and watch the like you know what happens if the golden age of atom bombs what happens if an atom bomb falls on your high school you'll be protected by half an inch of mica <laughs> oh god <laughs> scholastic films present nuclear <laughs> <laughs> like that's what my dad grew up on so he was he was that was his whole life until like i was born did you see the tiktok oh my god i saw the best one the tiktok it was nobody told captain america about hiroshima and nagasaki (laughs) (laughs) so it's like him interrogating this russian who's like i will drop nukes on america and he's like nobody would ever really do that right on innocent civilians and it's like oh god Uh, we did (laughs) We did that. We, 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 did, we, we, we did that. <laughs> we regretted it though, for sure. Yeah, because um, then we made a bunch of movies like this, and like this was 1983. The wall didn't fall for six more years. This the the way that this approaches the Cold War, the mentality, as well as just like technology in general. Yeah, early 80s is so different than late 80s, and I think you you get a, an idea of the technological boom that happened in those 10 years. Oh yeah, yeah. When you watch this, and then you watch Ferris Bueller, I, exactly. You know, because like what he's doing with all those little gadgets and tools and stuff fascinated me in this film oh he's a, he's a phone hacker yeah that was like by the time ferris bueller came out that was dead yeah you just you, you just had the internet anymore. like <laughs> right i mean you didn't but uh, the fact that like he would be excited about learning dos systems yeah something that we're like retiring right now <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's nothing better than a DOS system though they They're still so haven't fast. matched that they still haven't matched that yeah, like if I could best. when I back when I worked at State Farm if I could do anything in the DOS system I would do it in the DOS system oh yeah just because it was so much faster than like point click drop down menu scroll all the way to Virginia yes or all the way to United States I'm obviously right. not in Afghanistan <laughs> right <laughs> You accidentally click United States Minor Outlying Islands or whatever. <laughs> United Arab Emirates. Yeah. U.S. Virgin Islands. Right. <laughs> no, it's like tab VA F1. Done. Yeah. And uh. that's that's what I was realizing today. It's like the F1, the F keys do nothing in Windows. I know. I'm actually missing on my keyboard like, F6 and F7. Like, you can rip them off and you'd never notice. <laughs> right? But like when I worked, I, I worked a job in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018 where I used those keys because I used DOS every day. Yeah. Oh, I did that up until uh, 19 is when we switched over. We, we dropped... AS400 in favor of uh, NetSuite. I have to and imagine, was, and if anybody is a State Farm team member or agent out there that's listening to the show right now, please let me know if Neko still exists, but I think it's probably gone all Salesforce by this point, um, and Salesforce is the devil. <laughs> let me tell you, I would take Salesforce every day of the week over NetSuite. Well, what our proprietary systems were fine, and then we decided to get Salesforce like halfway through my tenure there, and it ruined everything for a year. Yes, that is what new CRMs do. It's like, it's actually, it's so funny. I've been the, out of the game so long that I couldn't find the words the the the, the word CRM earlier. I was trying to uh, <laughs> I was trying to explain to, to what we use the DOS system for, and I was I couldn't find that acronym. Customer relationship manager. Yeah, no, it's so funny. It's like if you apply for a senior level, we're, we're getting into business podcasting right now. If you apply for a senior level position, you like need to have on your resume that you have worked through a major CRM change because it's so common. Yeah. Anyway, so um, we don't actually have listener reviews for uh this movie probably because uh, we didn't ask till late. It also occurs to me that maybe fewer people have seen this one, which makes me feel like maybe we should do some spoiler free, like entice you to go watch it part of the show. Okay. Um, I think that's fine, and I'll give you a reason real quick. Um, I'm gonna get, so let's let's do some binary. Uh, you have to see War Games. Yeah, you have to see War. This Games. is this is the the one of the best '80s movies. I absolutely love like of this. the of the air quote '80s movie. You know you know what I mean. When I say '80s movies, you know what I mean. You the listener, the royal you know what I'm talking about, right? It's not just a movie made in the '80s. It's a it's a thing. Yeah, it's not like this is not a John Hughes movie. This is the best movie John Hughes never made. It's, it's, what's so funny is when I think about '80s movies, I think about John Hughes. I think about War Games. I think about Matthew Broderick. I think about like high school age 80s movies i do, what i don't think about is return of the jedi or Indiana no exactly Jones. exactly i barely think about back to the future oh back to the future to the line more than the other two yeah i barely think about back to the future um but i do think about back to the future i think it has something to do with the fact that i mean not that marty is that much younger than 
um, than Luke Skywalker. No, but Marty like goes to a high school. Right. Speaking. Yeah. So 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 um, I'm gonna give it a one on the binary. Uh, and I'm gonna give this an 87 out of 100. That's interesting. So I really thought I haven't seen this movie in a while, but not not like a long time. But like for the last time I sat down and watched all of War Games was probably close to ten years ago, if not more. I have never sat down and watched all of War Games. I have seen part of it on Chris Millahan's Lake Television, and I thought that was the whole thing. Turns out it was maybe the last twenty five minutes for sure. <laughs> um, but I, I'm I, it, I think most people are gonna be familiar with how this movie ends, even if they don't realize it. I wouldn't say most people, but I would say like I would say most people listen to our show yeah if you're in a certain like geek community yeah but i bet if i asked emily who just sat down while the movie was on how the movie ends she would be like i have no idea oh you should not let emily watch the end of this movie well she sat she was sitting right there i was surprised but she was also sitting we have these little spotlights in the living room yeah and she was like we're turning them on before it even happened and i was like you know what maybe all for the better yeah i was watching it I was like oh god i hope emily didn't watch this yeah. but so i really the point i was gonna make is i really thought that knowing the ending of this movie was gonna kind of ruin it for me in a way that it just didn't because you know how you, sometimes movies are infinitely rewatchable right and you like the the story doesn't matter the re- i mean the the story matters obviously but like the reveal doesn't matter or whatever like you can know the the ending and i really thought that was gonna be one of those movies where i was like <laughs> it really takes everything out of it but it didn't i was shocked at how good this movie held up i was as well i um i didn't expect out of 100 give me out of 100 oh man 85 85 okay what i say 87 yeah 87 i really liked it I, don't get me wrong i think that this belongs on the shelf of like when you sit down to explain 80s movies to your kid this is on the list so i would not rather watch this than ferris bueller i would not rather watch this than the breakfast club yeah those i would rather two- watch this than pretty in pink or 16 candles or say anything or any I've heard of those. That, yeah. I w- so I think if I were to sit my kids down and be like, okay, it's time to learn about film in the 80s. You liked Star Wars. You liked Back to the Future. Let's let's really get into it now. Let's learn about high schoolers. I think Ferris Bueller is where I'd start. Yo, definitely. And uh, then, I'd rather watch this than Weird Science, than St. Elmo's Fire. Like, I think this would come right after Breakfast Club, though. I think it, I think it might come before, honestly. And I'll, t- I'll give you a good reason why. Matthew this movie Broderick? never got weird. The Breakfast Club does get a little weird. Now, some of the 80s movies get a little weird. They get a little racist. They get a little racy. They get a little sexist. They yeah. Get a- they get a little, they get a little sexy sometimes. They, I, the Breakfast Club, I truthfully, throughout the eighties, it was just like, what rude things can we say right. about and to Molly Ringwald on screen? But like, to my knowledge. Oh, Dirty Dancing. I would do Dirty Dancing before this. Easy. No, Dirty Dancing's not an 80s movie. Yes, it is. No, no, it's not. No, yes, it's not. it is. No, it's not. Dirty Dancing is is like, <sighs> Dirty Dancing is like a romance. Dirty Dance. I don't know if I can watch Dirty Dancing with my kids. I don't, I don't, I don't want to watch Dirty Dancing. My daughter talk about Patrick Swayze. I would rather watch Pretty in Pink. I would just ask, like, I would, I would have more fun. I don't like that movie that much. Oh, I love Dirty Dancing. It's I've also right. never seen Pretty in Pink. I mean, John Hughes is, is this is not a John Hughes movie that we're reviewing. It's a John Badham movie. John Hughes is a master of what he does. He's the he's the one that's synonymous with um with this whole genre for a reason. Um, But this movie never gets weird, right? Like, I can't think. I just watched it. I just finished it not very long ago, like like an hour ago. Um, And I can't think of a thing that somebody says where I'm like, oh, you can't. You might not be able to say that. Yeah, the only thing is like in the classroom at the beginning where he's like insubordinate to the teacher, but that's like, that was a funny joke. I thought it was funny. I thought that would hold up today. If you did that in class, well, I didn't like the It tells t- you about the it. It teacher. tells you what you need to know about David. The teacher was out of line for me. If you you couldn't be that teacher in 2021, mostly because it'd be on Zoom. You couldn't but, be any teacher from any movie ever in an actual classroom ever. Correct. Like, I love Dead Poets Society. John Keating would have gotten fired long before that. <laughs> Way Snape? before that. Any of, the, any, any of the English teachers in movies especially would be fired. They'd be like, no. why do you have this relationship with this one student? This is weird. You can't do that. You can't do that. You have to, you have to teach all the students, Paul Rudd. What do you think it... <laughs> What do you think it's like? This is something that stands till till today, where like students will go back to their like favorite teacher's classroom during their lunch period. What do you what do you think of that? Do you think that we there will become a time where that's like taboo? Um, I know it's like a social taboo right now, like or at least that's how it's framed. I don't think anybody actually cares, but I think the way that people talk about it, be like, yeah, I was so lame. I went and hung out with my favorite history teacher during lunch every day. I think that says more about the history teacher than it does you. Although I'm an adult who would be friends with the history teacher because we're adults. I I just think just just make friends. <laughs> 
like, God, lunch was so valuable. Lunch was so valuable. But there was nothing more stressful than, like, the first day of school, you have class all the way across the building when you're going to lunch. And your best friend is in physics right across from the lunchroom, okay? He just spent two hours with all of your tier two friends. Well, his tier two friends, you're like tier four because you're not in AP physics, okay? Your best friend gets to the cafeteria first and sits down with his AP physics friends who are all his tier two friends, but they don't like you so you can't sit with your best friend at lunch because it took you so long to get there because they don't like you and there's not another seat, okay? AP Physics is an entire lunch. So now you're just standing there like, are there any band kids? I know, I think the AP Physics kids and the band kids are bullies now, honestly. Like, I think we've gone that far against like... They they were, the AP Physics kids were bullies when we were in high school. I know you were in AP Physics. That's not true. (laughs) Maybe not Cameron, maybe not you, Matt Ryer. I'm calling you out, man. You were a bully. I think he was in my physics class. You didn't have lunch with me that year. <laughs> because I had lunch with the AP physics kids and you did not. I think I did. I think I did have lunch with you. That year. I think because I was senior year. No, that, because no, you would no. have you would have just it would have over because both Chris and I were in that class together. It would have overruled. I don't know. <laughs> Who did I sit with senior year? I remember you junior had first year. first lunch senior year. I swear to God. No, I or something first, third, stupid. Third, third. No, uh, it was junior year was the best lunch because it was i was i was one of, I, I know bethany poff was at that table yeah you bethany poff, that table? michelle spitz michelle spitz. i was there what a good table yeah i was there uh, it was a, a band table i was a good time. yeah we had a band table. table band table um i don't know but the, yeah the trope of like kid that goes and sits with the with the teacher during lunch like yeah i think that's gonna get weird eventually i think that i think that we have to establish i think as a teacher i think you have point. to keep that distance especially with like high school students you know it's weird as we were very close to our student teachers, especially in band, and they were, I remember one of them was like, I will not friend you on Facebook until you graduate and go into like a music program. Yeah. And and I remember being in high school and being like, that's so dumb, but we're friends. You're only like three years older than me. And then as an adult, I'm like, it is so important that he distanced that relationship. Yeah. Thank you, Will, for not friending me on Facebook. Well, it is the adult's <laughs> job to know that, right? Like, right. you know, because I get that he's like a senior in college or whatever, but it's, it's the adult's job to know that that well and i think we had such a tight relationship with hunter the year prior who was another year distant so i think that had an impact as well yeah that like it was less weird four years apart than it was three years apart or four and five and four or yeah. whatever uh and then like he ended up teaching near where we went to school so we didn't we didn't we did run into each other at one point, but like we could have gotten a beer, you know? Yeah. Anyway, this, the school, I get what you're saying about the school teacher and about David, um, but the school is so incidental to this movie that like it just sets up, it sets up he and Ali Sheedy's relationship. It sets up the fact that he uh, isn't, like and and I think the things they say about him later on are probably a little harsh, uh, and that the, they don't really set up the character based on the the parameters they lay down when he, when they're like, oh, he's the perfect candidate for Soviet recruitment. He's like, you know, bright but not that good in school, and then like, you know, doesn't have any friends, doesn't do anything. Well, I think that's supposed to be. I think the audience is supposed to hear that and be like, oh, maybe we are kind of mean to the quiet kids, or like on paper, yeah, he's like this, but you know, in real life, Matthew Broderick is so charismatic. You know, he's God, like he this, is an infant in this movie. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's so not. Young. He's like. 21 is he really yeah i look he's born in night uh born in 1962 good god that makes me feel old yeah he and ali she are both they're both 21 in this movie's out but she looks significantly older than him yeah but he but he's so charismatic and he's so interesting and i think when you've like seen ferris bueller it's very tough not to be like like to recognize the charisma that he has See, i just never thought about ferris bueller chops. except for a couple scenes no i i didn't either i think he was young enough and actually like small enough small enough and, and the, the hair helps yeah yeah. He looks very different from Ferris Bueller, right? Like David Lightman's its own character. But yeah, he is he's a young, charismatic actor. Yeah. And so you they've got him playing this like hyper nerd, which I think the casting was smart. I think they very easily could have gone for somebody who looks like a hyper nerd. And I think that would have actually like harmed the image. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh like it would have done less le- more harm than good. Uh but but like he is interesting. So yeah, they're talking about him in this way of being like, well, he's primed for Soviet recruitment. I like to imagine the Americans of the Soviets because the only way to win is to not play uh or go and spoil their free you just spoiled it i mean you said the thing that's the line from the movie <laughs> right like that's the thing that people take away from it that's will wheaton and ready player one going the only winning movie is not to play you have to watch this movie it's so good you'll enjoy it so much this is Did a really cl- loud criticism of the cold war um yeah a very like not patriotic criticism of the cold war yeah this is on the side of the teenagers, like of the rebellion within. Yeah, God, if they just ever listen to the kids, man, once, just once, 
Yeah, I think like when he first he, when he he's talking to the computer at NORAD and it's like, obviously, I'm still playing the game. Well, there is no difference between game and reality. In 28 hours, I will launch weapons. And he's like, oh, crap, I got to tell somebody. And they're like, what are you doing? He's like, I got to I got to explain it. And they're like, no, you're a kid. You don't have to explain anything. I broke your system. Please let me tell you how it worked. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I, okay, I can't I keep going back to the phone hacking thing. How you like pick the phone up and just have like the computer dial random random numbers and then no not dial random numbers dial no. every number dial every number in order in order it's so good and then it turns back which ones are computers yeah i computers are fascinating yeah i was reading about the uh the history of uh video game sound which was a very boring book the book that i read but there were a few tidbits of interesting information like if you were to build pong like the original game right yeah without any the original game was tennis for two are you familiar with the sound from pong I mean, not off the... D I couldn't replicate it with my mouth right now, but probably, yeah. It makes a pong noise. Yeah. Anyway, it is, like, built into the circuitry. It is not, like, something that they added in. So if you were to, like, build it, you could, like accidentally include the sound that's wild very cool that's how it ended up that's like, wild existing yeah. played on like it's, an oscilloscope right it's not like a midi file it's like baked into it that it, <laughs> that's that it occurs. insane yeah because originally when they were designing the game they were like you need to include like an audience cheering and he was like i don't have enough space to do that so he just like manipulated the wires such that when you scored or when you hit it like a pong sound happened that's crazy isn't that the coolest thing <laughs> that's absolutely insane oh um, wow video games are wild when i think yes. of like the programming that goes into like a triple a rated video game that comes out on a next gen console it like my brain stops i get so mad at them how do they have the like intelligence to do this do you ever get mad at other people for being creative and you're like i thought i was the only creative person in the world um i mean i get i don't get mad at other people for being creative sometimes i have to remind myself that things like that are made by teams of hundreds of people yes and over over years and that i have sat through so many credit scenes in video games where it's like we listed the names of 800 Japanese people. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, because in my mind, I'm like, man, the guy who made The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is way better at things than I am. In reality, it's thousands of people. Right. It's like, uh, I, I do think it's funny how you like, you'll finish Borderlands 2 and you'll be like, Handsome Jack really was an amazing voice actor. He really put in extra work on this one. And he certainly did. Right? Yeah. But like giving no credit to the thousands and thousands of names that are scrolling across the screen right now. Right. Yeah. And even, even when you look at like wh what it takes to make like an indie movie like and how many people are listed in the credits of like an a24 movie oh i know greta gerbic really knocked it out of the park yeah and, 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 and like <laughs> you you forget how many people go into those things yeah i think you forget how many people go into anything that costs 30 million dollars well yeah and that and that's where most of the money goes <laughs> right paying people paying people to do the money just doesn't light on fire right it's not like oh to make a movie we just have to have 200 billion or 200 million dollars sitting in a box <laughs> <laughs> or they won't let us do it <laughs> It's like you have to pay 27 best boy grips. Right. <laughs> oh, I think I, so I used to be very much like, I don't care about behind the scenes. I just want the magic. The older I get and the more movies I watch and the more I, especially the more I read, the more interested I am. Oh, I in, love behind the scenes. In, in the production process itself. Yeah. I, through this podcast, I've definitely like started to pay attention to stuff like that more. And I'll like look at something and be like, hmm, I feel like I recognize this cinematographer. And Every now and then I'm right. <laughs> That's awesome. Where I'll be like, I won't know the names necessarily. Like, I'm not like, oh, this is, you know, John Smith. I, I recognize his work. It'll be like, is this the same person that did cameras on this movie? I'm I'm more so at the, I'm, I'm much more elementary with it. I'll be like, oh, John Favreau directed this. And then something will happen and I'll be like, classic Favreau. Oh yeah, that too. Definitely. Where I've started Such to notice, we'll, we'll do more and more things uh, by the same directors and I'll start to notice. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's obvious examples. Like I could tell you uh, the, 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 the particular tells of like a Wes Anderson movie or a Tarantino movie. Well, yeah. I mean, those are pretty easy to point out. But there's definitely, every director has their their things. Yeah. Classic Favreau. I don't know what John Badham's things are. You know what? Actually, this is one of the things about this movie is I was watching it. I was really impressed with the special effects here. I didn't feel like they like required my imagination to stretch too far i was actually kind of like how did they do this because the movie itself is like showing you peak technology of the day and yeah. obviously they don't actually have a whopper so it was like 
how did they get this like box with all these lights to go off when they wanted them to and to get the like little speaker line you know what i'm talking about on the like well yeah i mean it's just hey hey guys it's a box with lights i know that but like they didn't have led strips like i have okay but like the lights aren't the hard part of the whopper the the calculating the cost and the effect of a geonuclear war is the hard part of the whopper not (laughs) turning a light on no i even that impressed me it really did and then like the screens i love how in the end of the film they uh they had what was on the screen and then they would project that back on the actors to give yeah. it a sense of i thought that was like because it was just on the screen right like i don't but think I those are was... special effects i think those are legitimately practical effects yeah it was like a tube monitor right yeah there's like graphics right but if i put numbers on my television they're not going to have like clear lines on my face it's just going to be bright on my face i mean yeah yeah i I know it's a practical effect but i liked the practical effect i guess i don't know when you as soon as you say special effects i think i start thinking of like cgi cgi yeah think of industrial light and magic no i mean practical effects in this case i like i liked the practical effects i like how they set up the whopper i think whopper's the dumbest name for that thing i mean yeah but but it's supposed to be a corny 80s movie they were corny on purpose that's true that's true like this was still supposed to be a fun family friendly movie it was supposed to be a thriller is what they were calling it i mean yeah it was it was i would say it was thrilling it was harrowing it was, oh my gosh i know the, get... so kate had never seen it and we're sitting there watching it together and like um as soon as he starts messing around with the with the uh global th- thermonuclear war simulation she's over there on the couch she's like oh god oh god this is not mm, mm, this is not gonna go well this is not gonna go well and i'm like yeah no s babe <laughs> <laughs> we're 30 minutes into a movie it's gotta have something speaking of things not going well um who's gonna win kong or godzilla huh so they announced they, there's like a trailer for godzilla vs kong oh King kong godzilla. Vs. godzilla godzilla Hands do you think down. godzilla wins that fight yeah absolutely let me, let me break something down for you king kong has opposable thumbs godzilla is like 20 times bigger no not in this not well in this he's film. supposed to be that'd be a big damn ape <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, I know that he, I know that King Kong is a big ape, but that's a big Kong is like Kong climbs the the Empire State Building. Godzilla squooshes it. <laughs> I believe this Kong could could pick Godzilla up Godzilla. Big State as fuck, my dude. I, I mean, let's watch the. Can you watch the trailer with me? Sure. All right, let me pull it up on YouTube. Is it okay? So is it is it in the current Godzilla verse? I believe it is in the Kong, uh, Godzilla. I, I believe it's the Kong from Skull Island. All right, let me let me share the trailer with you. The same one I'm watching. Okay. Because I haven't watched it. I've only seen the discussions. It comes out in sixty days. I know. I was hoping maybe we'd cover it. I like the idea of liking these kaiju movies. Maybe doing a little deep dive into kaiju history here on Bacon and Eggs. Okay, I'm watching. Kaiju. Two minutes, 24 seconds long. God. Yeah, that Kong is way too big. Kong's on the side of the Americans. I've got chills. Okay. Godzilla's still way bigger, my dude. Godzilla is way big right Way here. bigger. Oh, I guess he's not, actually. Oh, Kong- they're the same height. Okay. Kong is so big. What is oh, this- that's sweet. What is this, like, this Fort Minor so song cool. playing in the background? Yeah. If Godzilla has two, I'm sorry, Kong has tools, he wins this fight. Easy. <laughs> All right, so it's Thor versus Thanos is what I'm seeing here. Yeah. I think I think if Kong has tools, this is an easy fight. How did man defeat the dinosaurs? So here's my thing. Uh, King Kong sucks. Um, <laughs> like the original 1930s film? Yeah. No, just as a character, as a thing in movies, King Kong has always sucked. I've never been. King Kong is the piece of kaiju that I've never been into really ever uh, i did not really like the jack black movie that much when i was a kid this is a jack black kong movie yeah pretty sure it was jack black oh you talking about the one with the video game yeah four magazines on backup <laughs> That was another Chris Millahan Lakehouse thing. I yeah. think Chris had the King Kong video game. Yeah, the King Kong video game. Um, I no. here's the here's the thing about me. I fucking love Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> um, that Godzilla 2014 Godzilla was sick. It's it only was in it for like three minutes. Awesome. It was an awesome movie. Uh, Godzilla King of the Monsters tried too hard. You don't okay, so so Godzilla I movies are Mothra right. What? Is that the one with Mothra? Uh, or? no, it's just like bigger Godzilla. It's the one that had, uh, the, where they, they, it's got Millie Bobby Brown in it, and the trailer played like a really ominous version of, uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Yes, but at the end, it's like Godzilla fights, it's not Mothra, but it's, it's one of the, one of the big kaiju monsters. I don't remember. Anyway. Uh, that was 2019. 
Um, here's here's my prediction for the end of Godzilla vs. Kong or Kong vs. Godzilla. The Raptors team up with the T-Rex and they bring down the I mean, so, so Actually, that was, that was the point I was going to make is the fact that they've never involved Jurassic Park in this is coward's play. The Indominus Rex would get would be a toothpick to both but all of these of, monsters. But all of them, but all of the dinosaurs, but all of the dinosaurs. <laughs> but the Indominus Rex doesn't work with the rest of the dinosaurs. But the What's dinosaurs the rule the world now. Didn't you watch Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom? Did, okay, then bring in Caesar. Bring in Planet no. of the Apes. Hey, <laughs> no. Those movies are trash. <laughs> I hate those movies. I know you love them. I've never understood it. I've only seen the first one and I thought it was fantastic. I have no idea what the rest are about. <laughs> they might be about apes. They might be about other stuff. I, I couldn't say. So the first one is Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. I and couldn't then, even tell you. I know it's got James Franco. And then Rise of the Planet of the Apes. And then Battle for the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, that's it. Did I just nail that? Hang on. I don't think there's one called Battle. Hang on. War for the Planet of the Apes, I'm pretty sure. Hang on, hang on. Planet of the Apes movies. Boom. Rise of the Planet of the Apes, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, War for the Planet of the Apes. I thought there was four. Uh, no. Huh. Well, I mean, there's, there's, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine total. All in the same canon. No. But we got the prequel. No? I mean, th theoretically? Theoretically? <laughs> Not in the same way that, it's like- It's like if you made a Star Wars prequel. <laughs> like, like, as much as they wanted to, they couldn't be like, well, this isn't, like, like, you could go out and make a Harry Potter movie. Um, called like what Dumbledore did five days before he met Harry Potter and just be like this is Harry Potter canon they'd be like no it's not and you'd be like ah but it is <laughs> but and, like is they can't it? like they can't say it's not right like it grossed 600 million dollars I'd say it is it like it's a it's 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 it is a it's a reboot is what they called it but it never but they don't overlap it's not a it's a reboot it's not a remake like so like yeah. they never so it was like Planet of the Apes Planet of the Apes 2 Planet of the Apes they had names but it was one two three four five um and then they were like we're gonna make 0 0.1 0 0.5 and 0 0.9 but not make one right they never they never had the one they never made their own never, version of one never in the in the andy circus versions is there one where they find the statue of liberty right i don't know i have not seen the last one i can't imagine there is though well, I mean, they do, like we don't because see that, that much I mean, that, of the that's, future. It's, it's, it's the Star Wars problem at that point, right? Like, do you show somebody Planet of the Apes first and get him to see the point where they, um, where they reveal the Statue of Liberty? Because that is a great moment in cinema. It is um, so good. Spoilers. Or do, you, or do you show him James Franco? I think you start with Caesar, especially since it's a pandemic movie. I think you go for that one, right? But then you know that it's Earth. Oh yeah, that's a good reveal. That's what I'm saying. Is is you don't the Planet of the Apes? It's called Planet of the Apes because you don't know it's Earth, right? So I guess it is a. I guess it is a. a canonical prequel the only one that's not canonical then is the tim burton one uh the 2001 remake i haven't seen that one either it's all right i've, I've seen it's the not original. as good as the it's not as good as the the one that i don't like that much i've seen the original original like the planet of the apes yeah with the, but just the first one of those as well I'm yeah sure. i mean that's the only one worth watching that was back when they just made sequels they just do it like yeah let's do it right like there's there's like five psycho sequels yeah and they're none of them are good <laughs> most of them were tv movies and they Shark didn't have the same guy playing norman bates for any of them <laughs> um war games though. did you think they needed to have a love i think they they did i actually was surprised that she was interested nobody has ever been as effortlessly cool as ali sheedy was in this movie yes is she wait a minute ali sheedy yeah. is she the weird girl in the breakfast club yeah oh she sure is she was the one that i had a crush on uh yeah i think growing up is is realizing that for everybody <laughs> It's like growing yeah. up and watching the original, the 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 the, the Matthew Lillard, Sco Lillard Scooby Doo movies, and realizing that the Velma's the hot one, Leah Cardellini, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and being like, oh, so like obviously all of them are beautiful, but but this is an awakening. <laughs> but yeah, she's she the, the the one they're trying to play off as as the the weird nerdy one. I, that's not to say Molly Ringwald's not beautiful. She of course is. No, but that's the op that's the easy answer, right? Like that's the that's what you're supposed. That's to think. what you're supposed to think. Yeah. Who is she in Ready Player One? Ali Sheedy. Yeah, she's not. She wasn't in it. But <laughs> if you go to her on uh, Rotten Tomatoes, that's like it shows. No, it doesn't. I don't know what I was looking at. I don't know. She's talked about in Ready Player One, not the, the movie, book? but the book. Interesting. Because uh, what's gonna, her name? Artemis is like why can't I play as Ali Sheedy? Okay, so I have a problem with Ready Player One. Real quick, while we're talking okay. about the eighties, I feel like. 
War Games allows me to talk about Ready Player One. If you haven't read Ready Player One, it's the best book ever. You might be like, I don't know, Tyler, this is a little gratuitous and this is kind of white man energy. I, I, I'm i a little white man. Uh, anyway, and then they made a movie and the movie was like bad. And then they and then Ernest Klein wrote a second book and it was like fantastic. But now they're going to have to make a second movie because the second book was good. I don't uh, think they are because there's no way to get from, there's no way to be, get from point B back to point A to then get to the correct point B. Actually, I think they can the movie ends with wade in anorak's study doesn't it no the movie ends with wade being like and we shut down the oasis on tuesdays and thursdays and everything was fine <laughs> oh yeah no wade wade would not do that <laughs> and then the premise of book two is what happens if we shut down the oasis ever ever no Global what really happened what really happened war. is uh ernest klein read a beautifully foolish endeavor by Hank Green and got out his laptop and said, listen here, you glasses wearing bitch. This is my story. <laughs> a novel by Ernest Klein. <laughs> I actually haven't read ABFE yet. It's on my list. I actually don't own it, which is bad. I need to get it before the hard copies, uh, the hard hard covers go away. Oh, uh, I have two signed hard covers. You can have one. I would like to have one. Yeah, please. that's fine. Um, I went. I did, attended a digital book event and they sent me one. Nice. I didn't realize happy, it was going to happen. Happy Thanksgiving. I just bought a ticket to like a like a live stream and then sent me a book and I was like, that's very kind. That's um, very kind. You didn't have to do that though. I did. I have already read it. <laughs> We are currently not attending, because it's happening right now, the book event for uh, Everybody Has a Podcast Except for You. Really? Yep. It's happening at this exact moment. Um, I believe it's actually, rewatchable, but... We actually have like eight podcasts. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't even 100% know if I'm going to read the book. No, I think I'm going to buy it, but I also... I have I already a confession. I have a confession. Yeah? I think the cover's really dumb. Yeah, I do too. And if I didn't know who the Mackle boys were, I would I would like so badly roll my eyes at this whole process. And I wish that that wasn't the case. I wish that I could get off my high horse for just I, a um, moment. So I don't think they care. They definitely don't. They definitely don't. Travis is doing just fine. Yeah, I think they I think their their agent was like, "Hey, you need to sell a book book, not just a graphic novel." And they're like, "Okay." Okay, doke. What you does need it to have get, to you need a hardback. Yeah. I do have all of the graphic novels, and I will buy this book because I love me some. But I'm also extremely boys. picky about cover design for books. I think a lot of book covers are bad. A lot of them. A lot of them. I do too. I think the modern modern book cover design is uh, mostly bad. Yeah, mostly bad. Ninety five percent bad, I would say. Yeah. Um, the exception being uh, Ready Player One, Ready Player Two, and a beautifully foolish endeavor and an absolutely remarkable thing by Hank Green and Ernest Klein, respectively. Yeah. Both of those are a, a fantastic of... example of how to make two books that look the same but not. Yeah. yeah. Different colors, but also the same theme. Nothing worse than when a sequel doesn't match. No, there no, really is hold nothing on. worse. There is something worse than a sequel not matching, and that is a movie cover. Oh, man. On a book. Is there any... Uh, so some books will do a new graphic cover after a movie and sometimes i think those work i will say that i have a movie cover or a, a film cover for the queen's gambit and there was no other way like yeah. that one doesn't bother me at all that's fine it, yeah 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 that yeah, one doesn't that's bother fine. me but like i just think about ready player one i think about how bad the, the cover for that got and how great the original cover was oh man because because here's here's the problem with the film cover i guess it's the film cover is him in the stacks you have to do that because the because parzival doesn't look like parzival right it wouldn't have made any sense people start reading the book they'd be like I, he's not blue it's just so important with like the kind of books that you and i have read at least in the past or still kind of read like like you think about the, the ready player one books and the and and the hang green books and even the John Green books, like, all have great cover art. Yeah. The cover art is, like, important. It's part of the cell, especially in YA. It's part of the cell. The original the Hunger Games covers were incredible. Yeah. Um, they didn't do movie covers for those, though. Yeah, they sure did. No. They sure did. Like, with Jennifer... Yes, with Jennifer Lawrence. Je Why was I thinking Ecclestein? I don't know. Um, But, like, yeah, there's a there's a version of The Fault in Our Stars that has Shailene Woodley and Ansel Elgort on it. Yes. It's My just... copy of Simon vs. the Homo Sapien Agenda has, uh, oh, now I get the title. It's a good title. Yeah. Love that Simon Albert is a better Tal title. Yeah, Love Simon's a great title. But it's like the, the gay agenda, right? That's what they say. The, the, that's, yeah. That's what was involved. The homosexual agenda. In, yeah, in 2014 or whenever that book was written. That's, that's how you talked about the agenda. Nick Robinson is his name, by the way. Yeah, he's on my cover of that book. I don't know what the original cover looks like. 
Do you think she was just like, hey, Nick Robinson, do you want to pose for a book? Maybe, I don't think it'll, so. may, maybe it'll be super convenient. One I will day. say this is a particular this, this woman, Nick Robinson, is a particularly good. Um, oh, that is a great adaptation, actually. Google this. This is this is not egregious at all. This is great. Oh, you're right. Yeah. It just basically, it just takes it just adds the face. It just adds the face. Yeah. Anybody listening, just Google this. Um, yeah, no, that's excellent. But I was just I was going to say before I even looked it up, that's it's a good the one that's that's got Nick Robinson just with the, the um, thought bubble speech bubble is good. Yeah, that one. That one's pretty good. But that's not the movie poster as the cover. No, it's not. And that's that's the thing. That's the thing that's so important is they didn't just use the movie poster as the cover because selling a book and a movie are completely different things. Correct. Although movies sell a lot more copies. That's true, but if I if I if you say if you show me a book and it looks like a movie, I'm gonna be like, this is a bad because like fantasy covers are either incredible, or they're so bad, or they're so bad. Do you know who I can't read because of his covers? Even though I'm sure, like everybody says that he's the best fantasy author, Brandon Sanderson. Yes, Brandon Sanderson, uh, Robert Jordan, and who who? Yeah, yeah, awful. Oh, it's just so bad. Look up, look up. Original cover, The Eye of the World from the Wheel of Time series, Robert Jordan. Yeah. You would buy the crap out of this book. Uh, Yes, I would. But the later ones in the Wheel of Time, I would not, especially the ones that Sanderson wrote. Mm. Um, I would be like embarrassed to have them. That's what makes me so mad. Yeah. Th- that copy that you got of Name of the Wind is cool as sh- yeah. The, the original cover for Name of the Wind is awful. I hate, I'm like embarrassed to bring it places. Yeah, it's awful. Um, There are great ways to do fantasy covers. I, I, I don't. <sighs> I really like the 80s style ones that are like metal albums. Yeah. Where yeah. They've the, got like people in just ridiculously clad armor. I understand that it's like there's a reason we moved away from that. So there's a dude that used to that used to paint a lot of fantasy covers. His name is Boris Vallejo. And like this is cool fantasy art. Um. But then even if you want to make it modern, like the, I don't know what the original covers for Game of Thrones were like, but the Game of Thrones paperbacks are excellent. They're very simple. They're excellent. Yes. This Boris Vallejo dude, this is what I'm thinking about when I think of fantasy covers. Yeah. Maybe these, maybe these women's are a little too scantily clad. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> in a lot of these. Yeah. There's a line in the Mountain Goat song in League with Dragons where he says something like, uh, maybe Boris Vallejo paints the back of your head one day. Oh, that's gross. <laughs> what? Why is that gross? This this is so cool. I'm fascinated. War games. Try to figure out what the original covers of the Game of Thrones books look like. Oh, they were always pretty good. They've all got a color. Oh, I don't like the Game of Thrones covers. I think they're terrible. Really? I think they're fine. Ooh, that's a cool box set. Ooh, this one's good. I'll send this one to you. you. You'd buy this one. You might buy it right now on the call. I wouldn't be surprised. Is it a box set of Game of Thrones books? Sure is. I don't really need those. It's about decoration at this point. It's I'm not. It's bound. about buying books that I'm going to read in the next two. I did see this. This is really cool. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to buy <laughs> So, um, it's about leather bound lay flat copies of high fantasy. Yeah, I mean that's sick. For sure. For sure. Um yeah, the original art for Name of the Wind is for the for the King Killer series is so bad. Wise Man's Fear isn't any better. It is just the most generic art I've ever seen. Yeah, it's like why like, would I pick like, this look book at this. up? Look at this. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. Why would I yeah, why would I buy this? Why book? would I buy that? What is it about? It tells me nothing. <laughs> it's about a man on the other side of an alleyway. Yeah. Which so far, I'm 75% of the way through it is not even accurate. Like that tells me nothing. Close does not spend a whole lot of time in alleys in this book. No? No. I have eight I hours and like, 19 minutes left. I don't like how in none of the covers, in neither of the covers, I guess there's three, but he's not on the third cover. In neither of the covers that he's on, can you see his red hair? That drives me crazy. The third book's not even done. It doesn't have a cover. But in the slow regard of silent oh, things, oh. he's not He's not on the cover either, which I guess he's not the main character of that one. Uh, the red hair thing is, is really like uh, conveniently forgotten all too often. No, but like so at least... As far in as I am, which is not super far in Name of the Wind, maybe five hours, they often talk about eye color and hair color and how eye color is like so impacted by the world around them. I would have really liked like, you know, maybe a close up of his face where you could see his eyes and his hair. No, under- what you're describing is worse. I think it is. Yeah. What but- you're describing would make a worse cover for sure. Um, I, so, so they, they, so they talk about Kvothe having this flame bright red hair, right? Like the most distinctive hair you could ever hair. Yeah. Then they also just like, and Kvothe disappeared and nobody saw him again. And I'm like, yeah, but they, they would have noticed him though, because he has the, the world's most, he can't blend in ever. You don't get to let him blend in ever. Because he has the reddest hair. <laughs> right. But then he just blends in. He just does. It's just super convenient. The hair He's thing. He's got a hood. What's that? He's got a hood. Yeah. But I mean, he, like, like he would be, he's sitting in a bar and nobody notices him. Like, Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. Well, it happens on like page five where the guy's like, your coat or your cloth. And he's like, we have to knock that guy out. That's true. <laughs> he, can't, <laughs> he 
He can't. I got narrow to the knee. Okay, this book is pretty freaking good. Now I want to talk about it. I'm not even done with it. But I'm still in like slog through it part. Yeah, I was gonna say you've got <laughs> nowhere. They're extremely good. I'm. I'm. Hey, I have eight minute or eight hours left of the Wise Man's Fear, and then I'm gonna be very sad that the third one doesn't exist. You're gonna have to read Slow Regard of Silent Things, which I think will take you an afternoon. It is very small. It's like a hundred pages long. Yeah, and then you'll be like, well, I guess I gotta go back to Name of the Wind. I don't. I don't. Like, I don't even know if I'm going to read it because it's, I don't know if it's worth spending money on. I guess you'd have to like buy it. Yeah. You'd have to use a. I'm certainly not using an audible credit on it. Right. Well, I own it. So you're more than welcome to borrow it. I might, but I'm not using an audible credit on it. But I never use an audible credit on anything that doesn't cost more than $15 anyway. Yeah. Why would you just buy it? People do that all the time. Although Amazon's gotten better at hiding the price of things. I don't know. They're so weird about like, you can't buy this in this place. So very annoying. So if you do a transaction through an app, they have to pay money to um, Apple. Yes. But so if you buy with a credit there? through the app, they don't. Yeah. Why would you? So they, they direct you to the website because um, they don't because then they then they don't have to pay, I guess. Which is weird They're because just... I would say the Amazon app opens more than I ever want it to. Like, I would not say I'm a big user of the Amazon app. I'll like I'll instinctively go to Amazon.com and it'll like open the app for me without me asking you to. Yes. Which is interesting because like Audible is the other way around completely it's like please don't please don't try to buy anything through the app please 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 go to audible.com please go to audible.com in safari or go to the amazon app and buy it i'm willing to bet bezos was like can i just have my fees waived in the amazon app and and apple was like yes can you buy a book an audio book in the amazon app that's a great question i think you can i feel like i've seen that i will say i uh i become a heavy user of amazon's free catalogs oh definitely like if there's something free in the uh borrow from amazon prime catalog that's how i will decide what to read fun fact uh you cannot buy an audible audiobook in the amazon app huh learn something new every day you can also not buy a kindle book in the Amazon app. Really? Yeah. I need to uh, fix my Kindle subscriptions because I've had so many different devices over the years because of, you know, I'm a glutton. For e-readers? Yeah. For e-readers and tablets? Yeah, you are. And then, like, I'll download, like, anytime I get a new phone, I'll put the Kindle app on there and I'll never open it. Um, oh, I'll yeah, get a new once. iPad or I get a new tablet. one time. Or, never on my phone. I've tried. You cannot possibly expect me to read a book while TikTok is on the same device. That's insane. I will say this. Um, there When I typed in the slow regard of silent things, on which I don't know why was the book I decided I was going to buy on Amazon. Uh, but it, you also get the option to buy the uh, the Spanish version, uh, which is called La Musica de Silencio, which is the music of silence. Oh, that's a much which better is a name. much better name. It's way good. It's like that's a better name for any of the stuff. Yeah. Although the name of the wind is pretty good. Kind of. I expected it to be more like Turtles All the Way Down and less like this is the magic system. Um. Yeah. I, I'm going to hold off saying anything. OK. I Are will say that, all... that it is a book that satisfies my enjoyment when they say the title in the thing they say it quite a lot. often yeah quite often both often often here the, the uh, this is what i hate about reading sequels as audiobooks though is uh the, you know enough time went by from the time they recorded the first audiobook then they recorded the second audiobook that a homeboy that's reading it either got notes or forgot but was just like I'm going to change the way nouns are said. Uh, I hate that. Like, I don't care if you said it wrong, wrong in the first book. It's that way now. You say it like that. So many of those words are freaking made up. Right. But it's like, that's the thing is I'm trying to, there's, there's sometimes where I won't even catch what he's talking about for until the eighth time he says it. Cause like, oh, that was the same word from last time. That's the the Chandrian. Okay. Yeah. And the second book is Chandrian. No, it's not. (laughs) Chandrian. But in the, the first, say. in the first book, he's like, it, you know, I, I concentrated my ailer. And in the second book, he's like, I concentrated my alar. Well, and I'm like, why know. did you change? That? that was so pointless. That was such a, that was a weird move, brew. How is Rothfuss doing these days? I think he's in good spirits. Also, the part where uh, Wade, where Parzival is at the top of the screen is on the Breakfast Club. Uh, if you look the Breakfast Club up on Rotten Tomatoes at the top, you get Ready Player One. What? Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. That's what shows up. Um, <laughs> No, it's not. <laughs> What's on my screen? Oh, yeah, it is. Look at that. It is indeed Parsifal. Weird. But I, I did type in The Breakfast Club into Rotten Tomatoes, and it asked me which of the franchises I wanted to look at between The Purge, The Fast and the Furious, The Exorcist, The Hunger Games, The X-Files, The Board Collection, The Conjuring Universe, The Walking Dead, Friday the 13th, The Pirates of the Caribbean. It is the worst. <laughs> I've got the same thing. Rotten Tomatoes has gone so far downhill. No, I don't think it was ever good. I think we just use it enough now that we're like... It's like when you work somewhere and you know your company website better than everybody that calls it. In, and they're like, why isn't it just right here? And you're like, because I'm not the web designer. 
designer. Okay, that's why. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm telling you how to get there. I'm not telling you why it's this way. Just like be cool. Okay. Just be chill. <laughs> be more chill. <laughs> First, you have to use the hamburger menu in the top left. Okay. <laughs> then you. <laughs> the hamburger menu? Yeah, so those three lines are called. That's a hamburger menu. Really? Yeah. I've never heard of that. Uh, that's what we call it at my job. Okay, good. That's a real thing. Uh, yeah. I just never button. had a name for that. Yeah. Just the menu. Well, I... I just know you, that means open here to find more options. Right, but boomers don't know that, so I have the... It's bun, patty, bun, okay? Click on that, and then scroll down, and then you're going to want to... I know it says what you're looking for. I know you're looking for sandals. Don't click flip-flops, click shoes, and that's how it goes every time, and then we get into like a well what's a sandal what's a (sighs) flip-flop well it's really up for debate most people would say they're the same thing and other people would say they're not it's more of a like a regional colloquialism and then we get into that conversation so it's a hamburger menu it's a hamburger menu okay i've just never heard that before i never knew that had a name i never i've never needed a name for it i've never tried to like call its name call me by your name (laughs) hamburger menu hamburger menu I don't remember what their names were anymore. Just be very careful if the hamburger menu finds an apricot. Oh, God. (laughs) Did you know Army Hammer's a cannibal? (laughs) You you been following all that? No. What is this? The Army Hammer's a cannibal thing? No, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Apparently, Army Hammer's a cannibal. Just like... I don't know. I don't know. I'm not 100%. (laughs) <laughs> but if, if there's that one tiktok where this girl was like uh it was like a month or so ago the girl was like yeah so um you know i like i, I waited on army hammer at a restaurant in new york and he was super cool and made like a dad joke about asparagus but he kept complimenting the waitress's neck and then like a month <laughs> later there's i guess some rumor that army hammer is a cannibal and people are like how hey, this aged well <laughs> Army Hammer. I don't hundred percent know what's going on. I just know that people think that Army Hammer is a cannibal. I don't know, man. Him and Timothy Chalamet have a have a like the a, boy Timothy Chablagou. The- <laughs> <laughs> I think Timothy Chalamet killed the sister in Little Women. That Beth? uh, he did not kill the sister in Little Women. She died of <laughs> scarlet fever. Uh, but that that uh, that Yeet song call has yet scarlet to not fever, make me laugh. Call it chlamydia. Call it what you want. The, the Timothy Chalamet, Pete Davidson uh, hip hop roundtable. Yeet. Has never failed to make me laugh yet. Not once. That's so good. When, when Questlove gets up and slaps him in the face, it's like, <laughs> that's not hip hop. We don't do that in hip hop. Uh, did you miss the podcast, Ethan? I did miss the podcast. I was so worried because I've been in like reading world for the past few weeks while we've been away. And in books, you have to stay on topic or else your editor will be like, you can't just include three chapters about Tom Bombadil and never come back to it. <laughs> Unless you're James. We allowed this because we hadn't read the other two parts of this book yet. But like, had we known from the start, we wouldn't have allowed this. Uh, But in the podcast, you can spend as many minutes on Tom Bombadil as you want. I don't want to spend any minutes on Tom Bombadil. I don't don't care about Tom Bombadil. It's a metaphor where you put Tom Bombadil in your mouth, but you never let him do the healing. What? The healing? (laughs) I don't know what Tom Bombadil does, but I'm pretty sure he heals the hobbits. Why do you put him in in your mouth? (laughs) Because it's a metaphor. I mean, yeah, but that's that. That's about cigarettes, about the killing. Okay, right, but he doesn't kill anybody. You put you put the thing that kills you in your mouth, but you don't let it do the killing. It's a metaphor. I don't know, hundred percent know that Augustus Waters understands metaphor, but uh, John Green was an English teacher to like half the nation, so I think they're probably good. <laughs> did he teach English? He did literature, right? On crash course, crash, crash course literature I of some think sort. So maybe I think he did world history. There is crash course literature with John Green. Oh, cool. Good for good for John Green. Good for old Juanito. I think John did all of them. I don't know. I know that the Psy Show, which was the one that growing up I did not watch. I've like, never I watched that show. No, I watched World History. I watched every episode of it. And then apparently when TikTok came around, everybody was like, you taught me science, Hank. I was like, no. Well, he also did. Hank's done a bunch of like crash course chemistry, crash course physics. Right. But I only watched the John Green ones. Right. Because why would I watch crash course chemistry? Because you were not want... a high school student trying desperately to learn chemistry when Crash right. Course came out. You were in college when Crash Course came out. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to know chemistry. I do want to know world history. I do want to know. I had, I had to read or watch Crash Course for some, for some classes. World history? I think so. Yeah. <sighs> I loved that series. Thought it was really well done. I'm pretty sure they're all pretty well done. It's a yeah, whole those, like, company. Those green boys. They Hank's got a lot of people stuff. that work on those. Yeah. I like the graphics the best. I think those are my favorite part. That's like most of what Complexly does. It's very little to do with Vlog Brothers of the podcast. It is so weird to me how many Everything people... Everything to do with the Crash Course and Show. So many people 
come to Hank Green and John, for that matter, from a, from an angle that is not watching Vlogbrothers in 2007. Yeah, for sure. That always blows my mind. A lot of people go, are shocked that Hank has a job outside TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> like when he when he was like yeah i run like a whatever 50 million dollar company 15 or million two like, i run two billion companies with a 15 million dollar budget but like, they're like oh how <laughs> and he's like I, I do things i'm rich i don't have a bucket 40 year old man i live in montana i don't have a bucket <laughs> 15 million dollars a 15 million dollar budget i don't have a bucket <laughs> I need a bucket i still don't know why hank green need a bucket <laughs> Who cares? Hank and I. It's just I the most, I it was dr- the most defeated I've ever seen that man. When he's in his garage, he's like, I don't have a bucket. So Hank and I have man, a I relationship Montana, I don't have a bucket. on TikTok where I've posted two questions and he's responded to both, both of them. I don't mean to brag. I actually have posted four and he responded to two. Uh, but Hank has also replied to a few of my comments. And I swear to you, he likes my comments from time to time. Like on random videos. I'll go into my notifications. It'll be like, Hank Green liked your comment. And I'll be like, how did he find it? He, I don't know. He knows who you are. <laughs> But he doesn't follow me, so my comments shouldn't float to the top for him. Uh, I'm not surprised Tank doesn't follow me. He doesn't strike me as like, my TikTok mostly is Star Wars stuff right now. He doesn't strike me as somebody that cares. I get none of your, like, fandom content. I get all of your, like, random content. Oh, I do, I do the trends. I do the duets or the stitches. Yeah, I get all your stitches. I do those. I think those are fun. Where it's like, tell me about a time where you thought about rent-free in your butt. Hank yeah. Green follows 440 people, which is honestly more than I thought he was going to follow. I think it's more than I follow. I'm very picky about who I follow, and I will unfollow if the content changes from what I wanted it to be. Very few of these are uh, blue checks, which is cool. I follow very few of the people that Hank Green follows. I follow 199. What are you at? Um, A lot, like, like 450. Good lord. 448. I'm starting to get tagged, not in videos, but like people will post videos and then I'll get tagged in the comments. Yeah, I'm not much of a creator on TikTok. Uh, I, no, I don't get tagged in Star Wars stuff, which is like the only fandom content that I post. I guess I did a Pixar video or two. Yeah, but you make but videos get, all the time. Yeah, and I get tagged in Pixar anytime somebody points out like a Easter egg in a Pixar movie, at Ty Carlin 11 is in the comments. And uh, most of them I haven't seen. So I'm always like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's a good one. <laughs> that's a neato burrito theory you that's, got there. It's, I ne- never, I'm never impressed by a theory but i'm always impressed by an easter egg an easter egg i haven't seen good work that's, a theory that's i haven't heard it's a good time is wrong <laughs> yeah i just can't bring myself to engage in tiktok i mean i watch i don't comment very much i have very oh, little I, desire to make videos i comment on every video yeah i know anytime i think about commenting on something you've already commented 100 <laughs> percent of the time <laughs> people have like started like following my comments they'll be like I see your comment in every video on my For You page, so I'm just going to start telling you every time I see you. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Um, I mean, there's definitely stuff that's on my For You page that I don't think makes it to your For You, for you page and vice versa, but when, if, if, if it's an overlap, you have already commented. Good. I'm glad to know that I... I it, are they good comments? Or are you like, Tyler, shut up. Stop engaging. Um, Yeah, they're mostly good comments. There I'm are definitely times fan. when you post videos and, and comments on TikTok where I'm like, I don't know this guy. <laughs> I'm like, this is the weirdest part of your brand that like I have the least connection with. So so on TikTok, my rule with going into TikTok was like, just abandon whatever rules you've set for yourself and just like do whatever. And that's exactly what I do. And it messes me up with the algorithm. I don't, actually, I don't think the algorithm cares what kind of content you make. I think the reason people think they're niche works is because their followers will engage with their videos only if they're part of like the reason you followed them i truly believe that the tiktok algorithm when your video is uploaded will show your video to 10 people and if five people like it then it'll show it to 100 people and if 50 people like it will show it to 200 and it'll just keep going in a progression like that i i, I mean but it, it depicts which 200 people show it to pretty strictly though yes and if you have a lot of followers and you make say star wars content and you come out with a dance video and your followers are like this isn't what i follow you for I don't even come to TikTok for dance content, then they're not going to like it and that video is going to flop. Or if you make a shitty Star Wars video and the first 10 people that see it are like, nah, then it's going to flop. How many videos do you see that have 50 or less likes? A lot. Okay. I'm definitely Same. part of a like targeted test group. I get a lot of, because a lot, I think because a lot of people who interact with my content are younger, I will end up with a lot of people who are fibbing to the computer to make themselves 13. So like literal children. I like a lot of stuff. I, this is I'm this way on all social media platforms, but I, as far as the like the tap engagement goes, I'm a, I'm an engager for sure. I like and comment on TikTok. I'm afraid to like on Instagram. I think that I don't even have Instagram on my phone. I right like now. F-ing everything on my Instagram page. Like I'll sit there and just be like, 
Tap, tap, scroll, tap, tap, scroll, tap, tap, scroll, tap, 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 scroll. No, I'm so scared of that. I'm, I'm like certain that if I like an image on Instagram, then that like sends a message to that person. I, it, it I'm doing it right now. I'm no opening. End. I'm just liking, like, scroll, eh, scroll, like, scroll, add, like. I, get to, I, do, this is I don't I, do the same thing on TikTok because obviously I know that like TikTok will, I look at things that I'm not following on TikTok. So like I'm a little bit more discerning, but like I, I will be, I will frequently find myself in the first 25 people who like a video. Yes. I, I'm always baffled by people on TikTok who will comment like, I can't believe I'm here before this is viral. I'm always like, well, yeah, this app pushes out a new viral thing every second. Yeah. But I mean, there's sometimes I see videos where I'm like, this has eight likes. That is, this will be viral in eight minutes. Like, <laughs> right. I am actually while, here at the beginning. Like it is while chosen to I'm show watching me. This. It is chosen to show me the blessed content. <laughs> <laughs> Not that's somebody how I else. Feel about, me. That's how I feel about Hank Green. We're like, I watched Hank Green in 2007, and none of these kids were even alive then. Nope. And they think that Hank Green is just a TikToker. Yeah. I love that, have, you, did you, have you noticed that John Green is being <laughs> accused of TikTok for impersonating, or accused by TikTok of impersonating John Green? Yes, and I love that. <laughs> Incredible. That is the best narrative in the history of... <laughs> And I love that he texted Hank and was like, I'm being accused of impersonating myself on TikTok. Do you know somebody over there who can fix this? <laughs> and Hank posted uh, it was just like, I don't know, you're an adult. Just do it. Just figure it out. Just figure it out. Uh, oh, man. But yeah, I don't expect to find your comments on like the dude that makes lo-fi beats on a Sony reel-to-reel tape player. No, I, I don't see. I get a lot of uh, like uh, horn music specifically like trumpet stuff that stuff always seems to find me which is so weird like it found me on instagram and i was like this is the algorithm working in a way i didn't expect i will it say to. that uh the the traditional band instrument music is way more popular on tiktok than i ever expected it to be yes like there'll be plenty of times where i'm watching some dude play a tuba and it's got five hundred thousand likes yes and i'm like okay so a lot of people are seeing the tuba video right like this is this is the population of wyoming that is like this tuba video <laughs> so it's not just them calling me out for being the band kid it is everybody is seeing this dude playing the tuba right i do think at some point like the the amount of likes makes it more likely for you to like. I mean, obviously, that's how it, you, you do it, like the mob mentality of like, well, I mean, nobody's going to know that. I, I mean, if I like this one, then I'm not a band geek. Everybody that doesn't like really affect one. me that much. Like, I won't be the first person to like something. I'll be the fifth. I like something if it's good. Uh, if I get on like small creator video. Yeah, if it's got I'm less always... than five likes, I'm not going to like it. No? <laughs> no. I don't know why. I'm just not going <laughs> to. What if I'm wrong? This is a bet I'm not willing to make. <laughs> And I will not like videos just because I know somebody either. Brutal. I usually do if I know somebody. It depends on whether or not I'm interested in that content because I don't want it to f*** up my feed. Well, that's the other thing is like, like I love Sam Jones. Sam, I love you. And I like all of your content. But every time I like your content, I'm like, I'm going to get a whole bunch of Americana singer songwriters on my For You page and I don't want that. Yeah, I don't either. I love Sam Jones. I don't want like alt country TikTok. I'm not interested. Not my thing. I like the song Sam does. And I think if I was like exposed to the genre for long enough, I'd be like, oh yeah, I'm into this, but I don't want to be. Oh yeah, but I'd rather just like listen. I'd rather click more like on Spotify and listen to artists that sound like Sam Jones instead of 15 seconds of Amanda Shire songs. (laughs) (laughs) Like I'm cool. I'm cool without that. I have other interests yeah what is okay so let's let's uh let's wrap war games we talked about that movie a lot we did and then we stopped talking about it like it was a bad habit i was joking we didn't talk about it yeah a we lot. did we talked about it for like 45 minutes oh good job us uh anyway I'm, I'm the curious. only winning move is not to play this is a movie about uh matthew broderick stopping the world from blowing up um by finding we didn't talk about the plot very much no yeah we also didn't talk about uh john or david hume yeah just like that was it that was a name i studied and i have a degree in philosophy yeah, Professor and that, Falcon. Was a, that was a name i studied in every single philosophy course Yep. Could not tell you what he said. Not a clue. What he said at all. Yeah. I read David Hume in philosophy and in like rhetoric. Uh, Yeah. Same. I'm almost certain it had something to do with the uh, the only solution is to not play. Gotta sure, be. That, yeah. Gotta have something to do with that. Gotta have something to do with that. But uh, other Ernest than that, Klein does know. that pretty well uh, actually in his uh, book, his follow up to Ready Player One called Armada. What, you mean like Ender's Game if it was Ener- Ernest Klein? Yeah. And the, pr- the protagonist is named Zachary Lightman. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Funny. It sure is. And, uh, That's so good. Watching war games today, I was like, man, it is the same story, except it's an actual video game. Yeah. It is not the same as Ender's Game. The Ender's Game one is like the opposite, but I don't want to spoil it because I'm going to make you read it. I'm not going to read it. Hmm. You should. All right. I read 2001 uh, A Space Odyssey. That was okay. That's good to hear. Yeah. It's I'm an looking okay at, movie. Uh, have you looked at the big board since we were gone? 
No, I have not. Well, Willow is at 13th of 15, okay. which you missed. Uh, Princess Diaries is at 11 of 15. That's lower than I would have thought. And uh, we've done 16 movies, and it looks like they did not add Hercules. Well. Which means I need to uh, do some control Z, see if I can't get it. Let me make sure this is the correct thing. I think it is. This last one I did. Yeah, this has got to be it, because Princess Diaries was 78.2. I did Willow. She got a 72. So... Hercules got an 84.975. Uh, which oh, I guess puts I should it, tally up the listener scores. Which puts it at an 85. Uh, just above Ratatouille, just below Fellowship of the Ring. That's so high. It's such an average movie. <laughs> it's such like a 50 out of 100. I really like that movie. That's it is a favorites. piece I've never cared for from the Disney Renaissance. I've also never been deeply interested in those stories. Well, the... Uh, Hercules is the, the movie Hercules is the story of Orpheus and I've always liked that story it's not it's the story of Hercules no it's not they spend like a th- two seconds of the montage covering the rest of his 12 tasks he goes down to the underworld pleads with the devil and gets back Meg and he can't turn around and get her it's freaking Orpheus I haven't seen it in a long time I don't really care to watch it again hmm I did something wrong. <laughs> I did something wrong. Very wrong with the calculation. Yeah. Because currently I have the audience score at a 161.25. <laughs> you probably got just one extra digit in there. Yeah, sounds like it. Okay, I can do this. I, I have the technology and the brain power to get a score for war games. A 100 for my guy Sam Press, which is shocking. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's a... That's much better. So let me just remember this correctly. I said 85. You said 87. Yep. Rotten Tomatoes was a 93. Rotten Tomatoes audience was 76. And Metacritic was 77. Yep. Okay. And the, you want the listener score? Yes. It is 81. Puts this at an 84.85, which is also an 85, but just below Hercules. Oh, this is so much better than Hercules. <laughs> I don't know that I would agree with that. So much more fun. So much more timeless. I, I don't know that I would agree with that either. I don't know that I agree with any of those points. You're wearing his merchandise? I can tell you in the next uh, three years, no one's going to decide that, that Hercules, is, I mean, that War Games needs a bad remake. <laughs> it's, I think it's been remade. The, the War Games? Yeah. Has it? Uh, that would surprise me. I know that when I searched it, there was more than one film by this title. But I, I mean, it's a pretty normal title. We didn't talk about John Wood hardly at all, or Dabney Coleman, or Barry Corbin. Um... I liked the cast a lot. Um, there's a movie from 2008 called War Games The Dead Code that looks like it is a sequel or maybe a reboot. All right. So what that does for us is it changes our big board. One, it's a wonderful life. Two, Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Two, Two Towers. I'm sorry. Three, Two Towers. Four, Fellowship of the Ring. Five, Hercules. Six, War Games. Seven, Ratatouille. Eight, Stranger Than Fiction. Nine, Hearts Beat Loud. Ten, Shrek. Eleven, Soul. Twelve, Easy A. Thirteen, Princess Diaries. Fourteen, Chronicles of Narnia. The Lion, the Witch, and the Ward. 15 willow 16 happiest season 17 santa claus thank you so much to jordan and scott and valerie and mary clay for filling in while we were away that was awesome yeah shout out to ines fue mayor of sincerely us a musical theater podcast for nerds or whatever it's called um for doing all the editing did she do all i think mary clay oh mary clay did the uh, the episode that mary clay was on correct yes yeah uh so shout out to mary clay for doing that as well <coughs> we and back shout baby. Out to ethan for editing this bad boy we back we back we, we back out here saddle we out yeah yeah Big things coming to WB&E, but before we talk about those big things, you should listen to Late to the Party. It's a real play D&D podcast, 5th edition. Yeah. With 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 a female DM, with non-binary player, with Scott Nicewander, and Ethan composes original music. I worked on some of that today, actually. And Camille, when you listen, you'll be like, if she could stab me with a sword, I'd be cool with it. <laughs> yeah, we just dropped a heater of an episode uh, last week. And it's a great, it is the best time to get back into it. Got a heater of an episode coming in a week, in a few days oh. after this. As the crow flies. Yeah. February 1st. First. This is an urgent message. If you or a loved one have been suffering from mild hallucinations, encountering what looked like a, a horde of zombies, lack of fine motor function, there was no parking, and I pulled up on the lawn and broke a sprinkler head. The inability to sit for long periods of time. Did you just break the chair? Jordan is holding a chair arm up. Roll to sit. Oh, did not do so good. Trouble using your tools. Are you going to take another smashy smash? I sure am. 13 probably doesn't hit. Does not hit. Sorry about the dice, Scott. (laughs) Or existential crises. And I'm playing Sunny Days, a high elf cleric, a half elf cleric, a quarter elf cleric, a mostly human cleric, a mostly human, but with a smidgen of elf cleric. You may be entitled to podcasts. Ask your doctor about Late to the Party, a Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition actual play podcast for the whole family. Available every other Monday on WBNE.org or wherever podcasts are sold. 
and we're announcing the new shows on WBNE starting next week. Yeah, next week so we're excited. covering Groundhog Day. Are we? Yeah, why not? Because we record on Groundhog Day. Black History Month. Okay, Bill fine. Murray's not black. I've been trying to get you to do Groundhog Day for like three years. Larry's not white. Larry's clear. We record on Groundhog Day. Okay, we can do Groundhog Day. I'm cool I with that. No, we can do whatever. We just haven't talked about anything. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We're doing something for Black History Month, but we can start with Groundhog Day. I mean, like, what, what, Evzies? I'm cool. I think part of a rule from coming back from this particular not vacation is that we're just going to do... We're going to do whatever makes us happy. Whatever makes us happy for a little while. Probably going to take me a while before I'm ready to watch Moonlight again. <laughs> a movie that is that bad heavy <laughs> well fortunately we don't have to watch moonlight again because we already watched it it's true we can watch hidden figures again i would be all down for that i will watch hidden figures every day of the so week. Good. but also so easy yes all of the above remember the hidden figures in the moonlight you know what i forgot while we were gone what how long an hour and 45 minutes is i thought we flew through this i feel like we've been recording since the dawn of time <laughs> I mean, usually we're like, this is like eight minutes past where we normally would be doing like the 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 Vaishan part. Speaking of which, we just got an email from Vaishan. Did we? Like, as I spoke. Okay. All right, do the thing. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Wrap the show, E. Anyway, um, <sighs> Siri, play words fail from Dear Evan Hansen because they done did. <laughs> I just started a sentence that didn't it stalled in the in in the gates. Um, thank you for listening to Bacon and Eggs, a production of the WBE Podcast Network. We enjoy doing podcasts for you because you like to listen to podcasts that we make. And Tyler and I have a big fun time doing this, and it's really good to be back. And I'm really happy to be back, and I'm really happy we get to talk about movies with my best friend. And it's 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 a good time. We have music by Andrew Scott Bell, AndrewScottBellMusic.com, and graphics by Vaishan Brandon, Graphite.VMB. Hit both of them up for awesome stuff for your podcast. Hit Vaishan up especially because he just crushed it yes and that is true um we'll be back next week with something do you want to do you want to say do you want to do any announcement no we're not doing it we have we have a plan for that um anyway uh you have any final thought until next week i've been ethan etch hill he's been tyler carlin arrivederci all right lightman maybe you could tell us who first suggested the idea of reproduction without sex um your wife this has been a wbne production for more great shows, visit WBNE.org.